Okay, everybody, hi. Uh, we're just waiting for everyone to log in here. We'll start this webinar in a couple of minutes. If you could just sit patiently, that'd be great, thanks. Okay, Bill, what do you say we uh, we get started? Yeah, sure, sounds good. Okay. Morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Bill, go ahead, hit the next slide. Thanks for joining us. Um, this is a uh, this is gonna be a great presentation. I've seen it a couple of times. It's pretty dense, so we're, we're gonna uh, move through these early intro slides pretty quickly for all of you. Uh, just real quickly, who's on the phone today? Myself. Uh, David Chesnick, I'm the Global Director of Marketing. Bill Coble will be giving the presentation today. He handles technical sales for our Eastern region of the US. Uh, Peter Myers, uh, who's not on the call today, but was uh, involved in, in helping refine the presentation. And Caitlin Clark, of course, our eye and exchange technologist is also joining us. Frank DeSilva, who spoke last month on softening is with us as well, just to lend support. And very quickly, the, the rules of the road as always, uh, mute your microphones. I think they're automatically muted anyway. There's no need to raise your hands. We're going to be submitting questions via the Q&A feature, as we always do, and then Caitlin will curate them at the end and, and make sure that we get answers out to all of you. Um, the, we're going to be recording the presentation again, so if you miss it, you can try clicking the link to the presentation uh, later on this afternoon, and, and you should be able to view a recording. Um, if you email us at webinars at resintech.com, I'm happy to send you a link to that or uh, a copy of the PDF of the presentation if you desire. And then we'll be capturing feedback on the survey via the QR code down below. And we'll show that again at the end of the presentation. So make sure you have your cell phones ready. Without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill Coble, who's been with the company for 21 years. He likes 21. to correct me. I think I cut him short by a decade when, when I did my introduction to him last month. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, you're practically the old man of, of, of Resin Tech. No, it's scary. Um, and Frankie and Peter. So without any further ado, I'll kick it over to you. All right, thanks Dave, appreciate it, man. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, been looking forward to this one. 
Uh, we're going to get into the fundamentals of deionization today. You know, my, my goals really are to just give you a solid base of understanding of how DI systems work. You know, and I'm a chemistry person by nature. So, you know, I feel the chemistry plays quite a bit into that. So we're going to start off with some of that. So I apologize if it gets a little cumbersome at first, we will get into the good stuff, but I do think it's important. Um, you know, a, a big part of the DI world is the service exchange DI market, which I know many of you just from looking at the attendees list are involved with. Maybe you're thinking about getting involved in it. So it's gonna have that kind of flavor here today. So, you know, all of this stuff can be applied to not only service exchange, but also in place systems. Just uh, keep in mind, I'm gonna be kind of putting that flavor on it with the service side, uh, just cause I think that applies most to those who are watching this. Um, so as I said, we're gonna get into the basic water chemistries. We're gonna hit it hard on the DI applications. And then we're going to um, just talk a little bit about the resins themselves. And then ho hopefully uh, we'll have some time for question and answer at the end. So in terms of systems, you know, we deal with multiple different levels of systems in the DI world. You know, you have the big industrial system, which are these big tanks, the big blue tanks you see there. They can be even bigger than that, um, where they're just fixed beds and they could be dual beds, they could be mixed beds, they can be all sorts of different types of systems, but they're big and they're in place. Then we get on the service, ex service exchange size, side, you know, here's a, just a simple little skid two tank system, um, but they can get bigger. You know, there are jumbo tanks, those are 30 by seven or 30 cubic foot, maybe 36 by 72s, and they can even get smaller than that, you know, maybe in a, a 618 or an 818. You know, those kind of all fall under that same group of service exchange DI. Then we get even smaller, you know, where we get to the point of use type of polishing systems that can be used in laboratories, or maybe these are used in conjunction with a small service exchange DI tank. Um, just some pictures of cartridges there. Uh, you know, these are just a couple examples of systems that even our Aries group makes. You know, a group of Resin Tech makes high purity polishing systems. So if you do get into uh, these types of applications, uh, please keep us in mind, that would be great. All right, so what is demineralization? Demineralization, deionization, it's really talking about the same thing. And really what we're doing is we're taking dissolved ions out of water, attaching it to the resin, and then the result coming out of it is water. But it comes in the form of an ion exchange. So we're gonna be talking about cation resins, we're gonna be talking about anion resins. In the case of cation resin, it's gonna exchange for a hydrogen ion, the H plus side of the water. And then the anion resin really exchanges for the OH minus of the hydroxide side of the water. And in the end, H plus plus OH minus equals H2O. And that's really what happens. Cation resin, anion resin, mixed bed. These are the most common resins that we're gonna use particularly strong acid cation resin, strong base anion resin, though we'll talk about weak base as well. And then when we get into mixed bed, it is really a combination of the strongs, the strong acid combined with the strong base. We won't really see mixed beds with any weak resins in it unless it's a specialty application. So for our world of service change DI, you get into the industrial level, it's always gonna be strong acid primarily, strong base, maybe some weak base, and then the mixed beds are always a combination of strong acid and strong base anion resin. And here's some pictures, you know, we use a black cation primarily in our mixed beds with the amber anion. So that way you kind of have this salt and pepper looking finished product. And the reason for that, which we'll hopefully talk about in part two of this uh, down the road, is it helps with separation during regeneration. Okay, so let's talk about chemistry. I know we're all excited to, I know I get pumped, um, but when we get into DI, you know, here's a list. You know, we, we, if we really dig into every single speck of deionization and water, water quality that's required, you know, these things are all gonna come into play. Really what we're gonna focus a little bit on today is talk about pH, conductivity, which comes together with TDS, and then, 
we'll talk a little bit about organic carbon, total organic carbon and TOC. Not really gonna get into my, microbiological or suspended solids, but if you have questions on those, feel free to ask them at the end. All right, so let's talk about pH first. You know, pH is literally just the measurement of the hydrogen ion in water. And really what I wanna point out here is, some of you probably all know this, but you know, when you're below seven, you know, the scale of pH is basically zero to 14. When you have a pH of less than seven, that is considered acidic. And when the pH is above seven, it's considered basic or alkaline. And the acid and the caustic, HCl, is the typical regeneration we, chemical we use for the cation resins. And sodium hydroxide or caustic is typically used for um, anion regeneration. So they all come in some way, shape, or form. We get into the ions themselves, the dissolved solids. We talk about what's in there. You know, you have positively charged things, which are cationic. You have negatively charged things, which are anionic. The big thing I wanna point out is in any given water, there is always going to be an equal amount of positive charges and negative charges. It's called the law of electroneutrality. You'll never have an imbalance. You're always gonna have an equal amount. Now there can be other things in the water that the resin may remove, but they're not necessarily ionized. So if you're looking at a water analysis or trying to understand how your system's going to behave, there's always a balance between the two. And uh, sometimes you look at a water analysis and you look at it and say, well, I got more cations than anions. Well, you can't just add up numbers when looking at a water analysis because things are measured different ways. You know, in our resin world, we look at everything as calcium carbonate equivalents. Well, on a laboratory analysis, it might be measured as ion or another species as a reference point. So those are the reasons why it doesn't add up. It's because they're not measured the same way or the math needs to be converted to get them to be measured the same way. Most common ions we deal with, you know, this is all typically in your tap city RO, or not necessarily RO, but your tap, your city, your well waters, you might be dealing with hardness, which is calcium, magnesium, iron. Uh, there's always some level of sodium, maybe a little bit of potassium on the anion side. The big ones we deal with are sulfates, chlorides, and bicarbonate. Uh, I mentioned hydrogen and hydroxide here because that's what we're putting on these resins to exchange. When we get into RO waters, really, uh, those membranes reject the larger ions. So we tend to be dealing with the smaller ions through an RO membrane, which can be on the cationic side, primarily sodium, maybe a little bit of potassium. On the anion side, primarily chloride, maybe some bicarbonate alkalinity. All right, let's get into some connectivity TDS because this is really uh, most important when we're talking about DI. A connectivity measurement is literally just electricity passing through a water and, and how well it conducts. The more dissolved ions you have in a water, the better the, the better the water conducts. So therefore there will be more conductivity. So it's not a direct measurement, but it's very close. And when we do the math or you have a TDS meter, typically, the math done on your TDS meter that's reading as sodium chloride is basically they took the conductivity number that's generated and they multiplied it by 0.5. Well, that's a good estimate. It's not exact. Every ion conducts electricity differently. Some ions conduct it a little bit better. Some ions conduct it a little bit worse. Usually that conversion is usually somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6. It's not always 0.5. So if you're doing some conversion to do some capacity calculations and you wanna be conservative, you know, using a 0.6 multiplier is always a safe bet. If you wanna be the average or the normal, then you can use the 0.5. A lot of times when we get into high purity water, we don't talk about conductivity, we talk about resistivity. Resistivity is just literally the inverse of conductivity, and it's usually measured in ohms or mega ohms. It's really the same thing, same measurement. It's just a different way of presenting information, which I'll talk about a little bit on the next slide. The last thing I wanna talk about conductivity is pH and how pH can affect conductivity. 
the hydrogen ion itself, the H plus, that the resin regenerates from the cation resin, or maybe you have a process application where they're using an, an acid to do some sort of rinse or process, and you go to measure the conductivity of a very acidic water, it's gonna be really, really high. The example I like to use for this is if I had two beakers or two cups, let's say one had 100 ppm of sodium chloride in it, salt, just regular old salt, and let's say the other one had 100 ppm of hydrochloric acid. Technically, it has the same amount of TDS. They're both at 100 ppm. So I go to measure the conductivity of the neutral salt. And like we expect, it should be about twice the TDS. So the conductivity of my 100 ppm sodium chloride solution should be about 200 conductivity units, which is either micromoles or microsiemens. Now I go to measure the conductivity of my HCl solution, all of a sudden it's 400, 500. And you're like, whoa, conductivity should be about the same as the salt. It's the same TDS. It is not. The hydrogen ion itself is way, way more conductive, much more conductive. And coupled with whatever anions it's with, it can vary, but you're going to see a massive rise in conductivity. And I bring this up as we'll talk about it a little bit with uh, looking at how pH changes through a DI system. But keep this in mind when you're looking at process systems or process solutions. You don't want to throw off your conductivity or your calculate your ugh, capacity calculations uh, because your pH is high. So I always feel it is a very good idea to check your pH with your conductivity measurements just to make sure it stays near neutral so it's representative. So as I mentioned, conductivity and resistivity of the inverse. You can literally take the number one, divide by the conductivity that you measured, and that equals the mega ohms of resistance. The easiest example to see this is when we talk about one. If I take one conductivity unit, what is it in resistivity? Well, let's take the number one. I divide by the number one, and I still get number one. So one microsiemen or micromo of conductivity is the same as one mega ohm of resistance. If I have 0.1 conductivity and I take one divided by 0.1, I flip it over, it really becomes 10 megs. So that's really where the relationship comes in. And I wanted you to see that. When I, when I started at Resin Tech all those years ago, I came from a world of conductivity. I never dealt with resistivity. So it took me a long time to think in resistivity and I always was doing this math. Um, and I couldn't do it in my head, especially now, it's getting much worse, but uh, it took me a while to understand the relationship there. The other thing I wanna point about, uh, out about resistance is just when you get to the highest end of the scale, there's such a small fraction of a difference between how much conductivity, and we could even talk about this as TDS, difference between a, a high and a low level of resistance. When we get into real high purity water applications, where they're holding a spec of maybe 18 mega ohms, 16, 17 mega ohms, where if that meter isn't reading that high number, they feel something is wrong or something's off, and probably something is. But I want you to notice the difference. The difference between 15 mega ohm and 18 mega ohm is literally just over 0 0.01 conductivity in it. And half that's TDS. You know, I like to say the Nat's eyelash, right? Something is a hair off that's causing why this system isn't making 18 mags and is only making maybe 15 or 16 or something lower. So as you get into these real high-end applications, it's very important to make sure all your ducks are in a row that the system is performing properly. All right, so I've been talking about conductivity and things conducting electricity. Well, there are things in the water that don't conduct electricity well or even at all. And they do affect DI and how they perform and their capacities. And the two biggest ones by far are carbon dioxide and silica. Carbon dioxide being the one that really chews up the capacity. Silica can also get involved, but it may not be at that same high level, but maybe your customer's water has a spec. They have a silica spec that you need to maintain. So you need to take this into account. And the third one, which I'm not going to talk too crazy about today, is 
naturally occurring organic matter, or basically what we measure as TOC in a water. You know, ion exchange resins by nature are not designed to remove TOC, but they can. But ion exchange resins are a plastic bead. They can add TOC to the water as well. They're not perfect. They're, ion exchange resins are in a perpetual state of breakdown, just the nature of how they work. So you can even clean it as best you can, but even over time, even after you regenerate, you're always going to be throwing a little bit of TOC off the resin back into the water. So it's really the two reference points I wanted to give you, is that naturally occurring organic matter may or may not be removed by resin at some level, and that the resin itself can throw TOC back into the water. All right, so let's focus a little bit on carbon dioxide and alkalinity. You know, any water, a pH of a water is completely dependent upon this, this balance of alkalinity species. And they're comprised of carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, carbonate, and the hydroxide alkalinities. Whatever the pH is, we can pretty much know what species are existing there. When you get into an this acid environment, you know, that's where the CO2 really starts to dominate, which I'll show in a chart here. But when you acidify alkalinity, like carbonate or bicarbonate, it basically becomes carbonic acid in water. Well, carbonic acid in water is nothing more than CO2 and H2O. It's the same thing in your soda. Maybe you have a soda maker at home. This is all you're doing. You're just jamming CO2 in a water to create carbonic acid. That's what exists. The last thing Ono mentioned, and this is pertinent, is things like RO membranes do not reject non-ionized species very well at all. And they certainly don't reject carbon dioxide. Always make the joke, RO membranes pass gas. Well, primarily because of the CO2. So when we look at the relationship of pH to all of these species, you know, it will change based on the pH level. Uh, that's a little cut down there, my bad. So when we're at a near neutral pH range, so this is around seven here, and this is actually 8.3 towards this spot. When we're in this near neutral range, the only two species that exist are the bicarbonate alkalinity, which is the red line, and then free CO2, which is the blue line. When you get into alkaline range above a pH of 8.3, or say it's 8.9, the CO2 no longer exists. It can't. The only two species that can exist are bicarbonate alkalinity and then carbonate alkalinity. And then when you get really high pH ranges, this is where the hydroxide comes in. But these are really the three things we have to pay attention to. So when we put it back into a context of the RO membranes and we reject these ions, out of solution, the only thing left behind is the free CO2. And I'm sure you all see it. What's the pH of the water coming off an RO system? Well, it's usually somewhere down here. It's in that pH, uh, call it four and a half to six range. This is the reason why. The RO has rejected those ions, leaving nothing but free CO2 behind. It is now the dominant species of alkalinity in water. You know, upwards, instead of maybe being down here at 20%, now it's closer to 80%, 90%. Well, the resulting pH is because of that carbon dioxide. But in any given water at any given time, whether the source was a well, a municipal supply, whether surface or, or other, you know, there, it's going to have a pH. It's going to have some relationship here of free CO2, carbonate, and bicarbonate alkalinity. Sorry, that backwards, sorry. Um, so when we're sizing ion exchange resins for DI, you know, it's always good to keep this in the back of your mind that, hey, there's gonna be free carbon dioxide. So if we're dealing with a 250 ppm TDS water, you know, yeah, we may not be worried about four or five parts per million of CO2, but if we're gonna put this water with all this bicarbonate through an RO membrane, and we reject these ions, leaving all this behind, and we're expecting that one ppm of TDS to come out of my RO membrane, well, guess what? That four or five ppm of CO2 that was also in the water that we weren't really worried about before is now passing through the RO membrane. So now you're not only dealing with maybe one ppm of, of this TDS contributed by bicarbonate or something else, 
Now we have to add the four or five parts per million of free CO2 into our calculations. So very important if you're sizing post an RO, be very aware that the free carbon dioxide will be in there. All right, I think I beat on that pretty good. Um, so back to TOC again, surface waters mainly contain these naturally occurring organics. Most municipal supplies come from a surface water source. Well water sources are usually pretty clean and free of this. Um, the main sources of it are uh, at least removable by resin are things like tannic, humic, and fulvic acids. As mentioned, the resins can partially remove them. And ultimately they can foul and, in, and in, impede your uh, ability to uh, make a water quality. So if you are treating a lot of tap water supplies with you know, surface sources, which most of them are, be, be, very, be aware that you know, your resins will pick these organics up and foul the resin slowly and could impede your water quality. Uh, and that's one of the biggest things we deal with in uh, at least the service exchange DI world. Now you can try to work to keep the resins clean and recover them, but that requires a big extra step of uh, doing cleanings, basically with uh, brine. If you can warm it up, great. If you can add a little caustic to raise the pH even better. Uh, but these are your basically your, your your best technique to try to clean your resin or keep the organics off long term. All right, our reverse tap waters, kind of bringing us all together. So those tap waters, those municipal supplies, those surface sources, wells, whatever it is, they're gonna contain a lot of the ions we, that I talked about at the beginning. Calcium, magnesium, iron, sulfates, all of them, right? A little bit of CO2, not so worried about it there, but when you get an RO, you know, we are passing primarily the small guys in, in low concentration. And we do want to keep that carbon dioxide amounts in the back of our minds. And we can calculate that. There's actually a, a chart with the CO2 to alkalinity relationships at any given pH in terms of percentage. So if you know your alkalinity of your water and your pH, you can use this chart, which I'm not going to show here because it's messy and it's ugly, but you can actually figure out how much carbon dioxide is in your feed water just by knowing those two parameters. One thing nice about our waters is because the membranes do such a nice job rejecting these big, large ions, including large organics, they are gonna be very clean and free of TOC. And one thing I always talk about with, you know, a lot of my customers with the SDI is if you can, or you're able, it'd be a good idea to try to segregate your resins from one another and segregating those that might treat tap waters from those that might treat RO or post other DI that are gonna be free of organics, A, to help prevent the fouling over the long term, um, which really makes a big difference. So if you have that ability or you can segregate those higher end uh, regeneration situations where you need it for post RO, you, know, you can actually maintain your float uh, a little bit more, uh, I don't know how to put it, um, precisely, I guess is a better way to put it, you know. But I know it's not always easy to do. It's just if something you think you can do or willing to do, uh, it might help you maintain quality across the board a little bit better. All right, so let's get into these systems. We've talked enough about chemistry. Uh, I'm already bored with it myself, just kidding. Um, we're gonna focus on two main systems and then a subset of the two bed. So two bedroom mineralizers, which is basically tanks of cation resin followed by tanks of anion resin. And there, I'm gonna talk about two types. One is a strong base two bed. And then I'm gonna to touch a little bit about weak base anion resin. When it comes to mixed bed, we're really only talking about one type. It's that strong acid mixed with that strong base. I'll kind of briefly verbally go over capacity calculations. I don't have, uh, I think we're gonna reserve that for the next, uh, the next webinar, I'll make that part of it. Um, but kind of give you an idea of what you're looking at. All right, so let's get into it. Strong base, strong acid, that's where we're starting. Cation regenerated with acid, anion regenerated with caustic. 
So here's your typical two tank system. You got the water in, usually always flow downflow. DI, even in the field, even uh, in place systems, not always the case. You're always going to have, or typically, it's always going to flow downflow. So the water comes in the top, out the bottom, whether you have a central hub and lateral that goes back up, the water is still flowing down and through the resin. Then exits out of a cation and then goes through the strong base or the anion. Uh, same configuration in the top, out the bottom. So we're going to look at this from a chemistry perspective. So we have our typical influent water chemistry here. You know, just assuming we're treating a surface or tap water supply, you got calcium, magnesium, sodium, you got sulfate, chloride, alkalinity, maybe some silica. I didn't include CO2 here, but you know, that's in that water too. When it passes through the cation resin, the H plus is exchanging for all the cations in the water. You get hydrogen as a result. Now, cation resin in a dual bed configuration is not 100% efficient. It's still going to throw a little bit of sodium. So you're going to have this trace amount of sodium coming through your cation beds at all times. Goes through the anion resin, things like sulfate, chloride, the alkalinity, the silica, for the most part get removed by the anion resin, the hydroxide form anion resin. And here it is. You have your H plus plus your OH minus. This is where we get our water. Now, again, that trace sodium still comes through and that's gonna be important in the next slide. So now let's look at this from a pH and conductivity perspective. pH going in, let's say that water had a pH of seven, conductivity about 500, goes in, what should we see coming out? Well, we created a bunch of acid. We should expect the pH to be low. Well, it is. Typically, it'll be a pH of two to three, somewhere in that ballpark. What will the conductivity be? Well, it's not 500 anymore. We just completely acidified the water. And as we mentioned before, acid conducts electricity much, much better. You should see a conductivity well two to three times what your influent was. That's normal. That is a normal troubleshooting thing to see. This is a good way to see if your cation and your dual bed is healthy. Am I creating this low pH, really high conductivity water? The answer is yes, then your cation is probably doing okay. Coming out of the strong base anion resin, we see the pH is usually around eight to 10. And you would think, well, aren't I making DI water? Shouldn't it be seven? Shouldn't it be neutral? In theory, yes. But because of that little amount of sodium leakage, that came through the cation bed here, you get an alkaline result. So I'm gonna go back one slide here. If I replaced one of these sodium with this hydrogen with, one, with a little bit of sodium, what do you see? It's a little bit of sodium hydroxide. Well, we know sodium hydroxide is an alkaline. It's a high pH and that's where this comes from. So you always get this little high pH coming out of your strong base due to that sodium leakage. And typical effluent uh, quality is anywhere from two to 10 microsiemens per centimeter or micromoles. And that conductivity is typically completely dependent upon the amount of sodium sneaking through the cation bed or, and I'm mentioning this now, if you do have a fouled or slightly fouled or even marginally fouled strong base with some of those big naturally occurring organic matters, tannic, humic, or fulvics, they can throw sodium as well because they are, they're anionic in nature. So they'll stick to the resin, but they're really weak acids. So when you regenerate that strong base unit with sodium hydroxide, you actually put some of the functional groups of the organics that are stuck to the resin into the sodium form. So as you pass water through, especially a low pH water, they'd like the low pH water. They would rather be in the hydrogen form then they'll slough off a little bit of that sodium. So this conductivity effluent is, a, is a gonna be a function of mainly the sodium leakage off the cation, and then perhaps maybe a little bit of sodium leakage off of some organic fouling that might be on the strong base itself. All right, so your typical two bed exhaustion. I don't want you to focus on the units here. Let's just look at the curve. You know, usually the way a, a dual bed exhaust, you get this low conductivity, Trust me, it's never zero. Um, it's usually, you know, like I said, two to 10. And it'll, it'll keep that quality for a good amount of time. 
then, and then as it starts getting consumed, and this is primarily anion resin, you start getting some slippage, you'll start to see the connectivity rising slowly. And the tighter your spec limit is on uh, quality, uh, the sooner you have to cut it off. But if you let it run to complete exhaustion, it'll rise up, it'll keep climbing up to N equals out, which is up here, but you'll see, you, you'll actually see a dip. And the reason you see a dip is that's where the silica is leaking right off the resin. Again, weakly ionized species don't conduct electricity very well. In the case of silica, it does go through a little bit of a change through the resin. It can be slightly ionized, but you'll see a decrease in connectivity before it skyrockets back up again. And that's really all this dip represents is the silica leakage or the silica dump at that point. But from a practical perspective, it's gonna maintain quality and then slowly keep rising until it no longer meets the quality spec that you're gunning for there. All right, let's talk about weak base. Weak base anion resins work a little bit differently. They don't exchange ions the same way as a strong base. When we talk about classic ion exchange, one ion goes in, one ion comes off. The way weak base works, it's more of an acid absorber. So what ends up happening, we have our same chemistry as before, goes through, cation resin generates that acid. We have, you know, case this case, sulfate chloride, we have alkalinity, we have that silica. Same thing happens, hydrogen, in, hydrogen forms, the anions pretty much stay where they are, and we still have that trace sodium. But once it goes through the weak base, these acid species, especially st only strong acids, mind you, sulfuric acid, so the H plus with the SO4, the H plus and the Cl minus, I could throw nitrate in here and call it H plus plus NO3. These are the acids that the resin removed because the resin actually absorbs this acid, then becomes ionized, and then removes the counter ion associated with it. Because uh, alkalinity, when we acidify it, becomes carbonic acid. Again, that's really CO2 and water. That's not an ionized species. Silica is not a strong acid at all. It's a very weak acid. That also doesn't get removed by weak base anion resin and passes right through. So weak base resins do a nice job of taking out things like sulfates and chlorides and even nitrates, but it will not remove silica and it will not remove CO2. And again, the primary source of the CO2 at this point isn't what was dissolved in the water to begin with, it was the alkalinity in the water that converted to carbonic acid once it was acidified. So the water quality coming out of here, this cation did the same thing as before, but the water quality comes out, typically you have a low pH. It's almost looks like an RO membrane, right? Low pH, four and a half to six and a half, that's being liberal. Usually it's around five, 5.2, somewhere in that ballpark. Connectivity is much higher. And that's because when we have an appreciable amount of carbon dioxide in the water, it will conduct electricity. It can be better than this. This is just kind of give you some reference point. It's not as good as a strong base and it never will be. And all the silica and CO2 in the water uh, that started and even the CO2 from the alkalinity passes right through. Where a good application point for these weak bases are, are typically in rinse recycle applications, maybe anything exposed to atmosphere where they really just gotta knock the connectivity down. I've seen plenty of DI applications where, hey, we just need to get it down to less than 50 microsiemens. Well, Weak base is a good fit there. You know, maybe you can use it for battery filling. You could use it for uh, recycling water. Heck, you, if you want to just make DI water for uh, just cleaning glassware, this is a great, 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 great way to do it. The benefit is, is that the resin doesn't remove that alkalinity. It has more capacity for things like sulfates and chlorides. So you can get much longer throughputs through a weak base anion resin because it's not attacking these from the water at all, where the strong bases are. So that's really where it has its fit. All right, so let's talk about mixed bed. Mixed bed's kind of boring to talk about because really we're just gonna talk about two beds again. But mixed beds is a mixture of the same resins used in a dual bed strong base. It's, you know, it's designed to remove equal parts. We call it one-to-one -one ratio. 
Sometimes people call it 50-50, which is confusing sometimes because your typical industrial grade mix bed isn't a 50-50 mix of resin by volume. It's actually a 40% by volume cation resin and 60% by volume anion resin. The reason that it's not equal is that the resin's capacities aren't equal. The strong acid cation resins have about twice, not exact, but twice the capacity of the strong base. So you basically need two parts anion to one parts cation just to get the sites to equal up to quote unquote one to one. And that's the reason why. Um, you can actually play with those ratios. You can make a mixed bed of 20% cation resin and it'll still make high quality water. You could have 20% anion resin. May not be a great mixed bed, but you know, these are just set to try to balance out the throughput, but you can be off is where I'm driving at here. You can be a little bit off on your ratio and it's still going to perform. The best way to describe how a mixed bed works in my mind is described as infinite two beds. So let's think back to what we just talked about with dual bed. You have that cation followed by that anion. The cation resin slips a little bit of sodium and makes a water quality of two to 10 microsiemens. Well, again, going back, the reason for that lower quality or that quality itself is because of that little bit of sodium leakage. Now I want in, let's call that cation efficiency about just for discussion purposes, 90%. Let's say we get 90% of the sodium out with a cation bed and a dual bed. All right, that's fine. So let's say we had a dual bed, it made one ppm of sodium. Now let's put another dual bed right behind it. Let's put, put it next to it, right? All in series, one big train, right? All right, that one ppm got reduced 90% on the sodium down to say 0.1, okay? Now let's put another dual bed after it. Now that 0.1 got reduced to 0 0.0 whatever, 0 0.02, 0 0.01. Let's put another one behind that and put another one. Let's put a million of them in series. Well, eventually those dual beds keep removing that sodium leakage down to a point where it's nothing or it's zero. And the result is you can make very high purity water. So we have our tank of mixed bed, same water chemistry as before. Because of this infinite two bed principle, all of these ions that come in are getting completely removed and we don't have to worry about this little bit of sodium leakage anymore because it's basically gone because there's so many dual beds in series. So the resulting water qualities you get out of a mixed bed are upwards of theoretically pure water of 18.23 mega ohms. Not always the case. A lot of mixed beds in the field make 16, 17 megs and that's fine. And a lot of times the reason for that is just due to conditions. Maybe the resin's a little bit fouled. Uh, maybe the rate, maybe there's a little mixing issue or uh, whatever. You know, when you're doing a service exchange DI environment, you know, these resins are going all over the place, coming back, getting mixed together. It's not always gonna be perfect, but the more meticulous you are in regeneration and how you manage the resin itself, you can get 18 megs quite consistently. And this goes back to float management, and uh, just how we regen, which I'm not gonna get into it today because that's another hour. I'll hopefully do that on our next one. All right, typical mixed bed exhaustion. Again, let's not to worry much about the units. I want you to look at the curve. Mixed beds typically pop right up. You put them in, you rinse them for a few bed volumes, maybe 10, 20 at worst. It'll pop up the quality and should maintain it for a very long time. And then as it starts, exhausting, it'll slowly start coming down and to a point where it's just not removing ions anymore because it's completely exhausted. It's at these points you need to look at like, where do I cut my mix bed off? I get that question a lot. It's like, hey, I, how long, what's my mix bed capacity? Well, the first question I ask is what's our water quality? Because if you have to maintain a really high water quality, like 16, 17 megs, well, you're gonna have to cut it off here because as soon as it starts going below and it starts getting into that just, just under, you need to take it off. Well, that's, you know, and this chart is on grains, by the way. Yeah, that's wrong, it should be five, but this is in grains. So like 6,000 grains is a good cutoff for high purity. Well, it's like, no, no, I don't need it that pure, Bill. 
you know, we're running it to basically to complete exhaustion. When you're doing that, you can bring it all the way out to here. You know, so if you take it all the way down, now you're getting at nine, 10,000 grains per cubic foot. That's a big difference. That's 30%. So when looking at mixed bed capacity and how long it's going to last, the big thing you have to ask, the first thing you need to ask is what's my water quality? And we can help you with this. And again, I wish I, I had more time today, but you know, we'll, I can dive into the weeds on the next one on this, but know your water quality coming out. That's going to dictate the capacity of the mixed bed and then how you're going to impact, uh, how you're going to exchange or set up regen frequency. Another very popular question I get, or we all get, we probably all get it, right? Is pH of the deionized water. How many times have you gotten a phone call, somebody that's making a 17, 18 meg water, and they say, man, you know, something's wrong. And I'm like, what's that? It's like the pH of my DL water is four and a half, five. I'm like, okay. I'm like, what's the problem? You know, I don't understand what the problem is. He's like, well, we got to have it near neutral. And I always say, well, it is neutral. The problem is you exposed it to atmosphere. Higher, resist, high resistance wa resistivity waters are always neutral pH. And I want to show you this chart. This is the mega ohm scale. So this is one mega ohm, this is 18 mega ohms. The higher the water quality, the more narrow the pH of the DL water can be. So if you're up at this 15 and above, you're never deviating much more between six and a half and seven and a half at most, probably less. I can't even read this chart right. You know, maybe 6.8, 7.2. It's always going to be there. Now, as you get into lower quality waters, and this is where we can even bring dual bed into the equation, you know, you get that more broader and wider range. Well, other things can be in the water to increase the pH range. So it's very plausible if you're making a one meg or less water. Well, sure, the water can be a pH of six, the water can be a pH of eight. But when you're in this high range, this 18 to 15, it's always going to be around seven. The reason these measurements get skewed is that the conventional pH equipment, what's the way we measure pH? We take a sample, open it, open up the, 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 the valve, we fill it up, we walk over to our bench, we put our pH probe in and we try to measure it. That's probably the worst way to measure pH of high purity water. CO2 from the air just immediately starts dissolving in. Well, we know CO2 dissolved in water is carbonic acid. Carbonic acid will bring the pH down. Also, and I don't know all the details of it, I'm not a, an analytical person from a equipment perspective, but these pH probes need buffer for these probes to work properly. Well, when I say buffer, they need background TDS. They need some reference point in there for the probe to work. And typically potassium chloride is used or KCl. Well, you just made 18 mag or 15 mag or better water. There's nothing in there. There's no buffer for that pH probe to work. Couple that with the CO2 that dissolves in from the air, that probe's gonna do what it can and measure what it can. And it always usually results in a very low pH. What we see mostly, if you look at some really high-end DI water specs, you get into electronics grade water, specifically E1, E11, they don't even put pH on the specification at all. And the reason is for this, because they know they can't measure it without specialized equipment, but it does exist. There is specialized pH equipment that you can put in online. I don't know how exactly how it works, but I know it pulls water, pulls a sample, buffers it and measures it, all keeping it away from atmosphere. But we're talking about, you know, something that costs money that maybe people don't really need because again, if your resistivity meter is to 17 or 18 meg, we kind of know that the pH is near neutral. Ugh, okay. I know, capacity. The biggest thing I want to point out about capacity is the difference between virgin and regenerated resin. Virgin resin will have the highest capacity it will ever have. And this is just because the resin manufacturer, in the case here, Resin Tech, regenerated the resin in our plant. When we do that, we get the, the cation resin at 99% regenerated plus. When we do the anions, it's typically 95 plus percent regenerated in the hydroxide form. 
And so therefore the mixed beds we make or we send out in the field will have a very high capacity upwards of say 13,000 grains. Now in the field itself, the regenerations aren't as good. They're not as efficient. And it's not because you're not, you know, people aren't capable of it. It's just, we're slamming it with five times the amount of chemical that you would. And it just makes it uneconomical uh, to compete in a world of SDI. So what you guys really get in the field most of the time is a cation resin that's only about, mm, let's call it 80%, maybe 80, 85% in the hydrogen form. It's certainly good enough for DI in making high purity water, but you'll never make that same 99.99% .99 that we do unless you really slam the chemical, you know, triple, quadruple. You know, typical regen doses of hydrochloric acid on cation resins about eight pounds. Well, we're using like 30, 25, somewhere in that ballpark on, on an equivalent basis. Anion resins the same way. Anion resin regeneration efficiency is even worse. Typical field anion regeneration is only about 60%, give or take. Sometimes it's higher. It really depends if you're using brine for separation or if the water quality you're treating is very high in alkalinity and sulfate, but it'll range. But as a result, you're only getting about half the theoretical capacity of what the resin can really do. Now, the techniques we use in our plant, we use an intermediate, I'm not gonna get into that today, but there are ways you can do things to help improve that regen if you choose to, but be advised it's gonna double if not triple your regeneration costs. So, but it's okay. So it, the end result is you still make a good quality, high purity DI resin. You just won't have as much capacity as virgin. And the capacities are much lower here as we look at the mixed beds. Typical mixed bed capacity is about 8,000 grains. Sometimes it can be higher, sometimes it could be lower. Again, it all depends on your quality endpoint. But the ones out of the factory are always much, much higher. And the reason I bring this up is, let's say you're bringing on a new account and you're putting virgin resin, virgin mixed bed from the factory into their facilities. And our customers have a wonderful ability of measuring success based on time versus gallons. You know, a resin itself has a finite amount of capacity. It can only remove so much stuff. And depending on how concentrated that stuff is in the water and how much water you put through it, it can only do that many, that many pounds or PPM of TDS. Well, if you were to put a virgin mix bed into a customer's plant and they're like, wow, that lasted a month. That stuff was awesome. Most guys really did a good job, okay? But they were a newer account. So you needed to kind of get some mixed bed, get them going. And then the next exchange, you put in some regenerated. Still very well done, good capacity. But all of a sudden it lasts about half as long or let's say 70% as long. And you get a phone call like, man, I don't know what happened. Uh, this resin lasted a month last time. It only lasted two, two and a half weeks this time. Well, assuming the gallons treated were the same, the, the reason was is it was virgin versus regenerated. So my advice is if you're putting virgin resin out into the field is let your customer know, like, hey, it's your lucky day. I'm putting virgin resin in your tanks this week. It's just, we had to build the float. So you're gonna get the benefit. You should see a little bit longer throughputs than normal. So that way, the next time it comes back and you, you put the regenerated resin back in there, you don't get, you don't get that phone call. Like, what happened? Something's wrong. What did you do, right? Um, that you, they're aware of what the situation is. All right. Resin product, uh, products themselves. So the main cation resin that we use in our DI products is our CGAPL. This is that black cation resin that we've shown pictures of. It's what the black component is of our mixed bed. We like using this because when you regenerate it and you separate, you can see the difference. You know, with the amber cation and the amber anion, it gets tricky. But when you have a dark brown or a black looking resin, it's very easy to see. And uh, as many of you are probably aware, we're in the, just moved into a new facility in the last several months. And by the end of this year, we're gonna be cranking out our own American made cation resin, but it's all gonna be this dark colored resin. So it's gonna be nice. And hopefully we'll be incorporating that into a lot of our mixed bed products. But this is kind of the main one, the CG8 product, both a black, and then we also make the amber version, which can be used in either water softening 
or in DI, you can use it in dual bed. You certainly don't need the black color in a, in a dual bed because you're not mixing it, but you can use either or. And then there are other higher grades of, of cation resin, such as a 10% cross-linked, and then the macro pores. Typically, these only will be used in high temperature applications for DI, such as condensate polishing. You don't really need them in dual bed or mixed bed standard operations because you're not really exposing them to environments that they're going to degrade. And based on the cation resin having much, much higher capacity than the anion resin, there really is no gain in capacity here from a typical mixed bed or dual bed uh, uh, DI system. So for the most part, we're gonna use this stuff. On the anion side, uh, typically it's mainly the type ones. I'm not really gonna bring up the other types of strong bases. You know, SVG1 or SVG1P, these are our strong base anion resins, and the type 1 porous is the most common. Uh, it's the most uh, easiest one to regenerate, most readily available, most cost effective. It's a good product. Um, strong base type 1, it's this amber color. Uh, and then if we get into weak base, weak base doesn't look much different, to be honest with you. It's a little bit more white, but the weak base resin, the stuff that I mentioned before, like our WBMP, um, you know, uh, there's a free base form, you know, it looks pretty much the same thing, but these are kind of the resins you would use the CJ Black, the SVG1P, maybe the WBMP, and then the mixed beds themselves. So we mainly sell MBD15, also MBD10. They're, they're pretty much the same product at this point. Uh, you can buy them together. It's that salt and pepper looking resin. Uh, we make very different, well, we make uh, many different grades of this product from a standard, which we call nuclear grade or NG all the way to what we call our nano and even ultra. You know, as we slide up grades, uh, the amount of TOC that the resins throw after, after initial rinse at startup um, are, are gonna be lower the higher grade you go. Um, and then also just the rinse spec, like the SC grades and higher all uh, tested out to meet 18 mega ohms on high purity water, where the standard grade is kind of more of a workhorse, even though most of the time it does, I think we only have a spec for that one at 16 mega ohm. Uh, so depending on the spec of the water the customer wants or what you're doing, there, there's probably a grade for it. Uh, and obviously these go up in costs as you uh, you get cleaner and cleaner. And then as mentioned, we will have our uh, cation resin from our new plant very soon. And uh, hopefully make even higher purity uh, grades of mixed beds. We're really excited about that. For us industrial guys, we're excited about that. Uh, if we can introduce something even cleaner. So I'm gonna to try to bring this all together uh, to a degree. So if you get into a new DI application or you, you are or aren't, or maybe you're even thinking about getting into the business, which I'll comment on here in a second. You know, the biggest thing you need to understand is what's the customer expectation? You know, some DI waters have a spec, some, some don't. Some people will say, hey, I just want regular old DI water. Okay, no problem you know, then you can pretty much throw in what you need, but some will have tighter specs like silica, TOC. Maybe they have some other special requirements. These are important because resin might be able to only get you so far. You know, you might need to have other equipment involved such as TOC reduction via UV, maybe some high infiltration. You know, is RO pretreatment uh, already there or do you need to add it? Those kind of things. You know, understand the waters you'll be treating. They might have a water spec, but you need to take tap water and make it, well, resin alone may not be able to do that for you. You know, um, understand your chemistry of what you're dealing with is really what this comes down to. So sometimes they'll have an unrealistic spec for the water that you're feeding it, or sometimes they have everything you need that's there and all you need to do is put the right resin in, right? Um, and then just how are you gonna operate their system? What's the setup? Service exchange and place regenerable, et cetera, just uh, understanding how you're gonna um, take care of that client. You know, and if you're not in this business and you're thinking about it, uh, I'm gonna give you my two cents worth of advice. You know, the specialized equipment needed for mixed bed regen is tricky. Um, it's not rocket science. There is a lot of art to it um, in, in, in addition to the science, but all of that's pretty well known. Uh, but it is an investment. You not only have to invest in that regen equipment itself, but then there's the chemicals and the chemical storage, and there's the waste treatment, and collecting it and discharging it and permits, et cetera. Not always something easy to do if you don't have a way to make your money back. 
So if you're thinking about it, my best advice is to maybe work with a third party, maybe try to generate some DI customers and then work with a customer, uh, a company that can regenerate the resin for you. You know, if you can't find one locally, because that can always be a slippery slope if you're competing against them, finding somebody that's willing to regenerate for you. There are other options, you know, um, Resin Tech has a sister company called ACM Technologies. You know, we do this kind of work every day for, for our customers, regenerating resin, not only for, I know they're, they're primarily well known for um, metals and process, but we also do plenty of high purity stuff every day. So um, besides that, if you're thinking about getting into the business or dabbling in it now and talking of thinking about, hey, I might want to get a regen plant, I'm all for it, but same time might be good to maybe build up some client base to help pay for it once you do. All right, I went longer this time. It's the first time I've gone this long, but uh, I was talking a lot more. So that's all I had. Um, uh, questions, your time. Uh, really Thanks, appreciate Bill. it today. And uh, um, appreciate that, Bill. Um, we, we did go a little bit long, but we do have a few questions queued up. I'm going to let Caitlin run through them and you can answer them for the okay. benefit of the people that submitted them. So, Caitlin? Sure. Um, so, first question. MBD 30, is that strong acid, strong base mixed bed, or does it have a weak base in it? No, it is strong base. So it is a MBD 30, uh, for those uh, who may not know, it's our dyed mixed bed. It's actually a pretty neat product. Uh, the components in there are CG8, which is the amber strong acid. And then the anion component is the amberish colored anion resin, the, the strong base type one, like the SBG1 or SBG1P but we dye the anion component, this bluish green. It's very pretty actually. Um, and as the resin exhausts, the blue color goes away. So if you're able to see it in a clear chamber and the way resin exhausts uh, in a downflow configuration, it goes top to bottom, you can actually see the blue color go away. I actually have a picture of it somewhere buried on this machine. Uh, uh, it's pretty neat actually, but yes, it is a strong acid, strong base uh, resin combination. Um, why do you feel more manufacturers do not use DI resin for drinking water purification? Ah, great question. Uh, not a lot of them are ANSI NSF 61. Um, and it really, honestly, it doesn't make good tasting water. Uh, but there's also a smell, and, uh, smell issue that's associated with these DI resins. You know, anion resin functional groups are amines. And these organic amines smell like uh, basically dead fish. And the more exposed it is, or the more there is in the water with an elevated pH, the water just stinks. So that's why I think it isn't, because of the smell and then the associated taste and odor issues. Um, and I, I don't think the eye water tastes very good at all either. I'd, a little bit of minerals in the water make a water taste great. If you actually looked on some of these bottled waters uh, that you buy that say they're a natural spring or some version of natural spring. A lot of times they just take RO water and they put in a little uh, little alkalinity, a little silica and a little hardness and it makes the water taste really good. Um, but I think the taste and odor issues are the big part of it. And when you look at uh, approved technologies, uh, you're not gonna see a lot of mixed beds on ANSI NSF 61 lists. The only one company I know that, ha that does it and that's that zero water filter that you can buy at the store. That's all that is. Literally just type one mixed bed in a, in a cartridge. Okay, uh, what is the typical thermal stability for DI resin? Um, the max temperature operating that we recommend is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And that really has to do with the anion component, not the cation component. The cation component can tolerate well over boiling water. But the anion component, what actually happens is that the functional groups from the anion resin start coming off. They literally just fly off the backbone. And the technical term for that is cleave or cleaving. So what ends up happening, if you operate your mixed bed above 140, those functional groups come off, but they are, they won't ionize as a mean. So the cation resin will remove them. So you can still make DI quality water at say 160, 170, 180 degrees Fahrenheit but the resin won't last as long, both in capacity because it's breaking down. But then if you go to try to regenerate it over and over again, 
you're going to see a drastic loss of capacity because there's just it's just not there to regenerate anymore. And the if you're in a, a service exchange DI environment and you're mixing your resins back into a float, you're actually going to really be severely handicapping your float if high temperature resin that's been used and lost capacity keeps getting mixed in because you're just going to keep diluting the overall health of your float and losing capacity every day. So if you do get into something hot water or you want to, I do recommend you reach out to us just for some tech help. But a lot of times the answer is going to be is treat it as one time use resin or segregate it from your float. Don't reuse it. And uh, just make sure your customer is willing to cover your costs. Cool. Because resin is your workhorse in the SDI world. That is your asset making you money. So last thing you want to do is go crash in your car into a wall, you know, and still try to drive. All right. Um, how are the resins regenerated? What's the difference between a household water softener and a mixed bed? That's a good question. So household water softener, you're just using plain old sodium chloride. You know, you're buying salt at the store, you're putting it in the brine tank, that, that salt dissolves, becomes a solution that gets diluted and then pumped over the resin. When we actually look at this, and then the DI resins, we're using hydrochloric acid mainly, sometimes sulfuric for the cation component, and the anion is using a sodium hydroxide component. These are dangerous chemicals. These need to be stored properly. Uh, if you expose uh, either inhalation or burning, you're gonna, or you know, touches your skin, you can burn yourself and cause some severe uh, health issues. But, um, you know, taking away the chemicals for a second, if you actually look at the sequence, it's the same sequence. It's a backwash, it's a chemical addition, you're rinsing it out and you're putting it back into service. It's the same thing. But when you're looking at a DI world, you got to manage hydrochloric acid. You got to manage sodium hydroxide. You then have to collect that because you have a severely acidic solution and a severely basic solution that need to then be mixed together to create a neutral pH to discharge down the drain. When we're talking about sodium chloride, we, we don't worry about that stuff. It's already kind of neutral. There's no health hazard in handling it outside of, you know, you know, maybe needing to watch your blood pressure, right? You know, it's uh, salt is benign and easy to work with where acids and caustics are very uh, dangerous and need to be considered. So when you look at it on a, you know, small scale, you know, whether, whether it be a small commercial industrial application or, you know, I've had that question before, hey, I, can I put a DI unit in somebody's home? I mean, as long as they're willing to drink it, sure, but you still got to manage that acid and caustic and what are we doing with all the waste? You can't just put putting it out down the drain without collecting it. You're going to uh, probably corrode out any pipes they have going from their house to the sewer, uh, things like that. So um, that's my best description of that. All right. Um, so with re respect to the smell from the two bed of a um, strong base, is there a way to minimize or prevent the amine smell? From a DI perspective, it gets tricky. Uh, because these amine smells are completely pH dependent and, or, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at that for the second. So when you're looking at a dual bed, you know, with the sodium leakage that comes off, you're, you're creating a slightly alkaline environment. And these amines are perpetually coming off anion resin, just the nature of their degradation. It doesn't take much, you know, that smell that you smell, if you smell a slight fishy odor, you're talking probably single digit part per billion at worst. It's not that, that much in the air that you're smelling. But the reason you smell it is because the pH of the water that it's coming from is in an alkaline state. When you get around, when you get above a pH of eight, that is where the smell comes from. So how can we mitigate that off of a dual bed? Well, we try to get the pH down. You know, really that's the answer. You know, so can you improve your sodium leakage maybe to help keep the pH down off the effluent? Um, I've seen people put cation units after, after anion. So instead of being cation anion sequence, what they do is cation, anion, and then another cation bed. Because remember, these odor causing amines are cationic in nature when they're acidified. So if you put a, a, a hydrogen form cation resin after it, you can completely eliminate the smell because you've exchanged it onto the resin. The downside there is you've added a third tank. 
and you can also create a slightly acidic pH environment. But as long as it still meets the specs of the water you're treating, you can easily uh, eliminate that. Uh, you know, you can you you can use a another cation and get away with it. And in fact, it'll make really good water quality. You can take a dual bed quality and maybe even get one or two mega ohms off of uh, that that sequence. So I always call it the poor man mix bed. You know, can't really regenerate uh, mix bed on site. Well, what about a cation anion cation sequence? It can actually work quite well if set up and managed properly. And then smell off of a mix bed. That's always tricky. Um, that is also pH dependent. A lot of times it rears its ugly head with what you're doing with the water. So the water itself coming off once it exposes to atmosphere tends to be a, a slightly acidic because again, that carbon dioxide dissolves in that high purity water driving the pH down. You don't necessarily smell it, but where's that water going? Is it used in a humidification application where you're basically atomizing everything? Well, when you atomize water or heat water up, you're driving gas off. So you're driving CO2 out of the water. When you do that, you raise pH. When you raise pH, these amines now become gases in water and hence why you smell them. So mixed bed's always tricky because it's how you use the water that typically dictates the smell. With dual bed, you could try to control it with another cation. It's about the best I can answer that question. Okay. Um, what would be the benefit of using uniform particle size resin versus um, standard Gaussian? Standard resin? Gaussian, good question. Um, so in an, uh, an in-place regenerable equipment is really where we see the UPS a lot. Um, you, we see it quite a bit and also in DI floats as well. But let me focus, I'm gonna make this a two-parter. So in an in-place regenerable system, there are many designs out there, you know, there's that, 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 that require it because they're either a pack bed or they're, you know, trying to maximize to the nth degree what that DI unit can do. So in a conventional old school equipment, if you're just, if you're just regenerating downflow and backwashing up, you're really not gonna gain a whole lot. But when you're got a piece of equipment that's designed for a fixed bed, and some, sometimes they even take the resin out of the tanks and regenerate them in a, in a tertiary vessel, you know, those designs for flow and the equipment itself is very tricky. Um, they can't tolerate the really small beads a lot of times. That's really what it comes down to. You know, typical resin particle size distribution is 16 to 50 mesh which is like 1.2 millimeters down to 0.3 millimeters. Uniform particle size resins are really falling in the middle. You know, it's anywhere from, let's call it 0.6 to 0.7, kind of in that ballpark. And 90% of the beads are in that area where Gaussian kind of spreads it out. Well, some of these pack bed units to get the higher flows they need to operate during service, they can't tolerate those 0.3 Mil, you know, 0.3 millimeters. They need that 0.5 and higher to operate. So really the uniform product size eliminates those small beads. From a service exchange DI perspective, um, it, to me, that's a regeneration equipment dependent. You can get a much cleaner separations uh, and you can see them a little bit better with the uh, UPS resins. But if you're, if you, uh, it, it's tough today because modern day resins separate quite well. Um, but where I see the UPS and SDI to be in the most efficient is where you're not using things like brine. You know, brine is used quite a bit as a separation aid in the industry, and it works quite well. It makes resin separate very quickly. But when you get into, hey, I don't want to do that. I don't want to use that. You, you need to gain as much advantage as you can. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to just use the UPS resins. They they tend to separate a little bit better when you're not using something like brine to help. But outside of that, it'll regenerate about the same. They'll mix up and perform about the same. So um, uh, that's really, you know, from an SDI perspective, it very uh, specific cases. And then in the industrial world, it really comes down to the equipment. Well, it's the best I can answer that question. Gotcha. Um, what kind of quality could you expect out of a cat week P 
PEDI versus cat strong PEDI. Cat weak, cat, cat eye and weak base? Yes. All right, so a typical application, you know, it really will vary depending on the water chemistry you feed it. But, you know, I think I put 20 to 40 microsiemens per centimeter up there, but, you know, I've seen them produce 10. I've seen them produce five. It really comes down to the chemistry itself. So the big difference is you're going to see a much higher conductivity out of a weak base system versus a strong base system. And then the pH will obviously be lower too. So strong base resins spit out a pH of like eight to 10, but then weak base spit out, you know, pH is closer to uh, call it five and a half, six, especially after the resin cycled and been used for a while. So as long as they can tolerate the, the higher, uh, excuse me, oof, the higher level of conductivity in the water, and the lower pH, then you know, use weak base. The benefit really there is capacity. So if you can gain capacity, um, that's great. You know, use the weak base as much as you can, but do not mix your weak base with your strong base. Those need to be completely segregated at all times. You just certainly don't want your strong weak base getting in your strong base, especially in a mixed bed. It'll just kind of shoot the works up. Uh, can resins be coated over reticulated foam such as KDF-55? Oof, I'm not sure. You'd have, you'd have to stick it. Somehow you'd have to find a way to get it to glue on there, you know, just to put it in layman's terms. Um, as long as you can find a way to adhere it, you know, it'll work. I mean, I, I mean, there's ion exchange membranes that are basically that, that are basically just powdered up resins that are mixed with some sort of I don't know, some chemical that will adhere to a, a fabric backing and they roll it up and they make uh, membrane systems out of it. Um, so I, I guess it's conceivable, but you'd have to find a way to stick it. And I just don't know how to do that. Uh, especially with something like KDF, which is basically a, um, like a brass type metal, you know, how do we keep those surfaces happy with one another and sticking together? Um, don't know. Plausible, conceivable, yes. How to do it, no clue. <laughs> um, okay, so a question about regeneration. Super glue, I don't know. Kaylin, wanna start super gluing some beads to some KDF, see what happens, let's see what happens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just kidding, seriously though, but that's what we're talking about. Uh, go ahead, sorry. All right, um, for regeneration of mixed beds, you have to add the acid and caustic separately. Yes, so each resin needs one chemical or the other, and you can only be applied to those specific resins. We can't apply acid to an anion resin, then we can't really apply caustic to a cation resin. So they need to be completely segregated, the resins, and they can only see one type of chemical. And just simply, you know, when we're regenerating an anion resin with sodium hydroxide, what we're using is we're get, taking that hydroxide from the caustic and we're getting it to go back onto the resin so you can be in the hydroxide form. And we need that anion resin in the hydroxide form for the DI process, because remember, we're trying to create water. So the cation is exchanging for hydrogen, the anion is exchanging for hydroxide. If we were to have hydrochloric acid exposed to the anion resin, you're basically gonna put it in the chloride form. You might as well just use salt. And chloride form anion resin obviously does not create hydroxide to create water. So if you were have a, there are equipment out there, right? That where the cations and the anion is mixed in one tank and then backwashed and separated in one tank. And what they have is basically three sets of laterals. So you have a bottom lateral, which is where the cation sits on the bottom, acid goes in the, you know, um, that's where the acid comes from really. And then at the top of the tank, there's like an inlet diffuser it's where the caustic will come in. Well, in the middle is a collection header. So what ends up happening during the regeneration sequence, the acid flows up from the bottom, the caustic comes down from the top and it meets in the middle and it goes out this central collection header to drain. And it's very tricky because we wanna make sure that those resins are at the proper balance so that we're not getting any cross contamination because of this issue. We don't want that hydrochloric acid from the acid regeneration mixing with the anion resin so that we're not putting it into the chloride form 
therefore losing capacity. Conversely, you know, in a mixed bed environment like that, we don't want our cation resin up in our anion because again, that's sodium hydroxide. If we were to expose the cation resin to, to the sodium hydroxide, you're basically gonna put that resin into the sodium form. And as we talked about quite a bit today, sodium is what leaks off the cation resin and causes these quality degradations. So that's what ends up happening. You put too much cation resin in the sodium form, and then you, you know, uh, your resulting water quality out of your, after you remix, it may not be as good. So yes, they have to be separate. Each resin needs its own chemical, treat it separately. Do not apply them together because you'll never make the eye water. Okay. Um, what kind of water should the final rinse be before sending the tanks back out? DI? Oh, yeah. Good question. Beautiful. Yeah, this will be part two stuff. Sorry. Um, I mean, we could have talked for, well, I don't know if I would have made it, but, you know, three hours today on this. <laughs> so basically in a regen sequence, like when you do the backwash portion, you don't need anything fancy there. Heck, you could use hard water if you wanted to. I don't recommend it, but, you know, good soft water is perfectly acceptable for things like just the initial backwash. But once you start introducing the chemical, whether it's on the cation side or the anion side, the water needs to be some form of DI water, deionized water, specifically for the anion resin. Because if you have any TDS bearing in your water at rinse, you're just gonna consume the capacity of the resin or impact the quality of the regeneration. Now you don't have to, but if you're trying to make a 18 meg resin, on the back end, you certainly need deionized water for your rinses. And I would also recommend it for dilution on your chemicals and all your slow and fast rinsing, et cetera. Uh, you can get away with soft water on the cation resins if, for the regen, but really once you get into the final rinses, you wanna have a DI water source and, or even an RO is fine, you know, but you wanna have a high purity water source at that point to preserve the capacity, to preserve the, uh, the quality. Okay, um, so a little bit about lab water systems. Could yep. a typical water softener guy sell and support these? Is it mostly disposable cartridges, et cetera? Yeah, I think from an equipment perspective, I don't think it's anything you're not familiar with in terms of, you know, able to install. Because again, a lot of it, you know, might be some minor plumbing, but a lot of it's tubing from what I've seen. Um, and as long as the units are working properly, you know, which they do for the most part, you know, you're just changing out cartridges on a frequent basis. Uh, and then I look at like our business at ResinTech with the Aries group. I mean, they, they're, they're, they have a lot of smart people that work there that can help train and get you on, on get you up and running. The, the real, I think, challenge for those that, you know, want to say, get into this business, is just learning, learning the trade itself, you know, um, just understanding their world of laboratory. I've been doing this for 24 years in the water business, I still don't understand lab people, you know, and I talk to them every day, right? So you got to get to know the customer, get to know the people and what their trigger points are, you know, and I think once you do that a little bit, get to know some lab folk, um, then the DIY, then the water system itself is just something else new to learn. Uh, and managing it, I don't think is, 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 is going to be crazy for you, you know, but it's got to learn the business a little bit and I'm probably the last guy to talk to on that one, but we have some good folks over in uh, Aries that can probably help you if you're interested. So, hey Bill, just uh, to the, chime in on that real Oh uh, yeah, sure. Um, I know that to your point about Aries, they make it really easy for people. Yeah, right. They have like Thank a you. whole questionnaire that they, you can give to your customer and it basically gives them all the information they know they need to help you select the right system for the customer, so. Yes, Aries, Aries is your friend. Good job, Dave. All right. Okay. All right. Um, would you get a longer runtime for a dual bed if you use soft water instead of um, well water or you yeah, know, hardness? Water? No. Uh, the answer is no. I mean, the resin removes ions, right? So again, we're back to law of electro neutrality, and that we kind of can look at it the same way on softeners. So what's a water softener doing? Basically, taking calcium out and exchanging it for sodium it's still the same amount of plus charges going back into the water. So the resin itself will remove those equally. So in the end, you'll get the same basic, you know, throughputs where it makes a difference. And this might be where the question might be coming from. 
the, one of the easiest ions to get off a of resin, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, but sodium is actually really easy to get off a of resin. You just can't get it all off. The problem is it's so weakly held, it comes off first. So that's the problem with it. But from a bulk ion removal perspective, sodium is really easy to get off there. So let's say you had a float, like say you're managing a system, you know, uh, or they have a, a field system and they're feeding soft water to it. Well, they might get more better of regeneration efficiency if you do feed soft water to it, because now you're getting higher levels of recovery uh, on the cation. But again, we talked about capacity briefly, that cation resin has roughly twice the capacity of an anion resin. So if you have a field like dual bed DI system and the tanks are the exact same size, well, the capacity of that dual bed is always going to be limited by what the anion can do. The cation will always have excess or surplus capacity available. So trying to gain regeneration efficiency by softening ahead of time probably won't pay off in the end unless they oversized an anion. Maybe you have two anions in sequence behind it where you really need to try to maximize that cation. Oh, and that could also apply to weak base too. Sometimes weak base systems are cation limited versus anion limited. And that might be worthwhile. But as a general rule of thumb, uh, I, you really don't need to soften ahead of any DI to, to get any appreciable change in throughputs, unless it's a situation like that where you're trying to gain regeneration efficiency. Okay. That's going to be uh, in part two. I got graphs. It's going to be great. <laughs> graphs and charts. Who doesn't love that? Yeah. Do you think that long-term mixed bed resin can compete with CEDI on medium and large scale deionization applications? I do. Because CEDI or, you know, uh, we're talking about continuous deionization, electro deionization, great technology, but it, it can only get so far in terms of what kind of water quality it can produce. Um, even the best run CEDI systems can make 15, 16 mega ohms. You know, there are plenty of, of applications that need 18 mix. And the only way you're going to get there, at least as of today, that I've seen is to have some form of mix bed behind it. But I think it's a great technology. It's great. You know, if you look at it as all one big system, it's great stuff. If you have ROs followed by CDI systems, then mix bed, you know, the ones that I've been involved with. Um, a lot of times they don't even regenerate the mix beds. They just use the resin as a one-time use. But the beauty of it is that resin could last, I mean, I'm not kidding you, that resin can last a year. You know, and that that's that's not a bad thing because if they're just looking at annual change outs or maybe, some, you know, kind of in that ballpark, it's one less thing we have to worry about regenerating, especially when you get into some of these really high-end systems, like when you get an electronics grade, E1, E11, et cetera. You know, um, you know, they're not reintroducing, they, you know, they won't reintroduce DI resin as, or excuse me, regenerated resin on the back end. They'll always use virgin. So I'm actually a big fan of the CEDI systems because a lot of times where it's applied are systems that require high end mix bed at the end. And who doesn't love selling high end mix bed on a one time use basis? My two favorite words in this business disposable resin. Everybody should write that down. I'm just kidding. Um, getting a little kooky already. But uh, no, I, I think it's a good compliment. I think they work hand in hand. And uh, if CEDI ever got to the point it can make uh, 18 meg water with low TOC, then our mixed bed business is in jeopardy. But I don't see that day happening anytime soon. All right. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Um, Another question about um, like drinking water. Uh, uh -huh. Someone asks, uh, DI water is hungry, so it's aggressive for metals. Yeah. No, very and much plumbing. so, absolutely. Yeah, very corrosive water. You know, the corrosivity of a water really comes down to the balance of a few things, primarily things like calcium hardness, pH, and alkalinity. A DI water itself is void of all of these things. You know, and also, you now you throw in the carbon dioxide aspect from being exposed to atmosphere, if that's the case. It, lo it, it loves corroded metal, you know, but the key in that instance is oxygen. So I've seen DI systems that are used with deoxygenation that, that they don't 
you know, stainless steel keeps it clean all day. So when it comes to corrosion and understanding how things corrode, it's not always just the water itself, it's other things involved. So for the most part, yes, DI, DI water is corrosive, but usually that's because it's being exposed to atmosphere and in an environment to create a corrosion cell. If you were to keep that compressed, keep, this, keep the CO2 from re, be reintroducing and or remove the oxygen, you can run DI water through metal all day and it won't do a thing to it. So was that the question, Caitlin? I kind of felt like I cut you off there. I saw it, sorry. About that. <laughs> um, no, the question was, do you, would, <laughs> do you think it would leach minerals from out of your body? Cause that's a popular- uh... um, Yeah, it was a, well, at least you got a corrosion lesson. Um, <laughs> Do I think it'll leach chemicals out of your body? No, I do not. The way body chemistry works, it's all on a molecular level. It's a, your body sees H2O as H2O. So I don't think it'll do anything to your body outside of, you know, I don't know maybe hurt your teeth. I don't know. That's stuff might, like that. I don't might know. taste a little funky. It just looks, I, I, I seriously, so go taste 18 mega on water. You'll, you'll be like, this stuff is terrible. You know? <laughs> um, okay. Why do people even still use uh, dual bed systems? Uh, why not just use mixed bed all the time? No, that's a great question. Um, that is a great question. It comes up more often than you think. Um, you know, I see dual beds just because they don't need the water quality. Um, you know, they just don't need that high end. Sometimes they don't want it. I've seen some metal metal finishing operations are like, whoa, we can't have 10 megs. I need, I need one micro semen or two. Okay, well, that's a case where their water spec dictated the use of dull beds. Uh, then you get on the SDI side. Well, um, you know, there are big and small regenerators. There are companies that all they want to do is mixed bed. Their system is designed for mixed bed. Well, so when they get an opportunity to sell dull bed, it's, it's, they don't know what to do with it because they can't regenerate the resin. Conversely, there are companies that do regen that are more set up for dual beds because maybe they're doing it on a smaller scale where literally they can just backwash the tanks, regenerate in the tanks over on a wall. And that's really straightforward and easy for them. Where it makes beds a little bit more time consuming, maybe they have to regenerate each individual tank one at a time. That's a lot more labor intensive in that environment. So in that case, dual beds make a lot more sense because it's easier to process, easier to regenerate and push through. So um, I feel if you were a, so let me, let me pause this question. I want to bring this up and I was going to bring it up today, but I was going to save it for, for later. But when we look at, you know, field DI tanks, you know, like a sequence, like cation, anion, mixed bed. And really, what's the idea there? We're just trying to gain as much capacity as possible by making mixed bed quality at the end. From a resin perspective, it's just about how many ions, how much stuff can I remove before I have to come back and change those tanks? If you have a cation anion mixed bed sequence, you'll get the same or a little bit more water quality if you went mixed bed, mixed bed, mixed bed, because the amount of anion resin, which is really the limiting factor in DI, uh, is actually higher in three mixed bed tanks of same size than a cation anion followed by a mixed bed. And just do the math. So if we have three mixed bed tanks and we're doing a 40-60 ratio, let's say every single one of them was one cubic foot, right? So each tank has 0.6 cubic feet of mix, or, excuse me, anion in it. Three times 0.6 is 1.8 cubic feet of anion resin. Now let's look at the same system, but now it's cation, anion, mixed bed, all one cubic foot. We know there's no anion resin in the cation tank, so we just move that one aside. We have a one cubic foot tank of anion, so there's one cubic foot there. And then now your mixed bed, which we know is 0.6 because of the 40-60 ratio. So in that system, there's only 1.6 cubic feet. So it becomes 1.8 cubic feet versus 1.6 cubic feet. So in theory, if you ran those tanks to complete exhaustion, the three mixed beds in series will treat more water than a cation anion mixed bed in series. So I think you can go either way with this, depending on how you want to operate a service exchange DI business. If you're a mixed bed person and that's what you guys do, and you walk into an account that's cation anion mixed bed, 
I would go through this explanation and say, hey, I'm going to provide you three mixed beds. I'm going to give you the same amount of water treated and the same quality. You should have no problems 99 times out of 100. If you're a dual bed person and that's what you're better suited for in your business, then stick to it. No problem, right? So from a science perspective, if, if it's a customer spec, then that's one thing. If it's just from bulk ion getting to mix bed in the end, I think that's really dictated by how you want to do things. So, so anyway, that was that. Okay. And um, speaking of regeneration, how do you separate a mixed bed? Well, oh, patience and time. <laughs> well, you know, so in a separator, and this will be on part two on June 23rd at 11 a.m., um, you basically have this resin in a, a tank. I mean, nothing fancy, you know, specialized tank, but it's a tank nonetheless. You're basically backwashing it. And what ends up happening, the cation resin is denser than the anion resin. You know, and particle size is involved. It's called Stokes Law. But when you start backwashing a mixed bed, they will want to separate. So the cation goes to the bottom, the anion goes to the top. In a perfect world, all you would have to do is take your mixed bed, throw it in the tank, turn the water on, and just watch it happen, right? Go have a smoke, come back, it's all separated, life is good. Fortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, the form of the resin uh, is impacted, it imp impacts the ability to separate. The more regenerated the resins still are, meaning how much resin's left in the hydrogen form, how much resin's left in the hydroxide form, they'll tend to stick together more. And there's a few reasons for that. One is just their densities are closer to one another, but also there's a lot of static charge going on there when it's in those forms. So they tend to stick together. So even though you're backwashing, you might only see a third cation, a bunch of mix in the middle, and then anion at the top. The only really way to get those to separate is to kill them. And you kill them, the most common way to kill is brine, sodium chloride. And really all you're doing there is you're completely converting the resin into their salt form. So you're basically eliminating any remaining hydroxide on the anion or hydrogen on the cation, getting it to the furthest apart they'll be from a density perspective. And when you get the resin, cation resin specifically in the sodium form, it drops like a rock. So adding brine really helps get them to pop, right? I mean, you'll see it and then you see the line very quickly. So because of the variability that can come back from the field, sometimes people run the tanks to complete exhaustion. Sometimes people just run them because they're on a change out frequency of time that they're never fully exhausted. If you want to know who your customer and how those tanks are coming back, you could use it as makeup to your DI water storage tank in your plant. You could, uh, you know, if it's going to 17 megs and you got a guy you want to give a good deal over here for some, you know, getting some remainder of your DI life, that might be a good source for it. Or what most people do is they just treat the resin all the same. They mix it together. They always use brine to separate. And that makes their process consistent, meaning they know what they're getting. I'm putting, I don't care where the resin came from. I'm sticking it in this tank. I'm going to use brine. It separates in 10 minutes every single time. I transfer, I regenerate, and I get the same product out over and over again. Uh, so that's pretty typical of what you see. Uh, you can use other things to try to help aid separation. You could try to pop a little air mix. That might help it, help break some of that static charge. Uh, I've seen people do that. Um, I've seen industrial in-place systems, mind you, that they use sodium hydroxide. And again, that's to make the cation resin in the sodium form, but that's a very controlled environment. There is no hardness involved there. Any exposure to, oh God, I forgot to mention this today. Frankie, I probably wrote this down to yell at me after. Um, any hardness, calcium specifically in the presence of hydroxide will create calcium carbonate scale. So I'll bring this up now. Like if you do have a dual bed system, cation and anion, you do not want to plumb them backwards if you have a hardness bearing water. Because if you put calcium bearing or even magnesium bearing water, hard water, to a hydroxide form anion resin, you will foul it. You will cause scale and it will happen immediately. Now the resin isn't to a point of no return. You can simply rinse it with acid or treat it with acid to recover it. 
but that's obviously a process and a step that you're not normally doing. So uh, be mindful of that. If you are doing a lot of dual beds in the field, or even if your customer is doing them themselves, make sure they know not to put them in backwards for the most part, especially on a tap water. There are systems and cases where people actually do it on purpose, but for the general everyday application, uh, you certainly don't want to plumb them in backwards and file your resin. That was a good question. Thank you. Um, can you recycle the very last portion of the acid and caustic through the resin for yeah. say five to 10 bed volumes? You mean like a, uh, yeah, I'm thinking they mean like a static soak or just a, try to get that extra oomph, right, at the end. Uh, you certainly can, especially towards the end. There won't be a, any real problems if you wanted to do that. Um, when you think about the regeneration sequence, you know, that's really what a slow rinse is. The, the whole point of a slow rinse in any of these regen sequences is basically to get the maximum amount of contact time with the chemical. So think of a typical regen setup. You know, we pump the, the chemical in. I don't care if it's brine for a water softener, acid for a cation or hydroxide for an anion. You know, it'll stop at 20, 30, 50 minutes, whatever the cycle time is. Well, when that chemical addition stops, what do we have? We have a tank full of chemical that still can get pushed through and do some work. When you, when you regenerate and that chemical goes top to bottom, you know, it's really regenerating the resin top to bottom too. So when you get to the point of no more flow and chemical addition and it's still in the tank, a slow rinse is really there to push it down and through. So if you wanted to recirculate that at the end um, to help get the benefit of that chemical, I don't see any problem with it. Um, I see people do that a lot actually. So it doesn't hurt anything, it can only improve. But if you're gonna try to do this, some people think regenerating resin can happen by taking fully exhausted and just soaking it in chemical and that it'll be fully regenerated again. That is not the case. You need flow to properly regenerate a resin because you need, you know, and again, this would be part two or three, maybe even if we ever get there, when you regenerate a resin, you're, you're, you're basically reversing selectivity. You're, you're, you're driving the, the ion of, uh, on the resin off and putting the one you want on it. Well, concentration matters in that equation. So by flow, you're constantly exposing the resin to a chemistry you want it to convert. And it wishes the way the stuff you don't want. If you're in a static environment, that chemistry you don't want is now just gonna be intermixed with the chemistry you're trying to use to regenerate. What you end up doing is contaminating your regenerant that way. And then therefore you don't get as efficient of a regeneration. Now for something like maybe water softening, it'll work you'll get soft water back, no problem. May not last as long as a, a standard regenerated resin in a standard softener, but from a DI perspective, you may never make water quality. There might just be too much sodium contamination on the cation, or you didn't get good enough conversion on the anion that it just doesn't last very long at all. So I know that's a lot of more information than the question asked for, but you can certainly re recycle that last part as a through. If you wanted to, recover it, if that was really the question, like say the, towards the end of the regen, and you wanted to kind of throw that water back into the chemical storage tank to be part of your next chemical makeup solution, sure. You know, it's very, very low contaminant at that point. When you're regenerating a resin, uh, specifically things like anion resin, you're getting most of the stuff off halfway through the run. The real pesky thing to get off an anion resin is actually the chloride. And on the cation side, the, the one that takes a little bit more time to come off is things like calcium and magnesium. But by the end, I'd say the last third of your regeneration time, you've gotten probably 90% of it off. So if you wanted to recover the last third of your regeneration um, solutions and recover it to your day tank or whatever makeup, your chemical makeup solution tank, you could certainly do that. You're not going to put any major detriment to the uh, to the regeneration quality on the subsequent regen. So if that was the question, then the answer is yes as well. All right. Um, um, do we... <laughs> I'm fine with that, I'm just shocked. Thank yeah, you to everybody. 
yeah, they, they, they keep on coming in. Yeah. Um, is there a generic capacity calculator that you can enter water condition? I got a spreadsheet. The, I made this thing 20 years ago. It works like a charm. So if you want to email me, I will happily email you my spreadsheet. Awesome. It's very simple. It's just math. You know, but you input the TDS and the CO2 for your mix beds and you pick your water quality, it'll make pretty numbers for you. The math is actually quite simple. And and yeah, is it 100% accurate? No, but it, it's it's good enough for most 99% of your situations. But yes, I made a spreadsheet a long time ago. I use it every time this question comes up. I'll send it to anybody who asks for it. It's not rocket science. It's known information. And I'm happy to go through it with you. That's so, the one we went through before. Yeah, um, man. Good. All right. It's like four formulas. Yeah. You know? So go ahead and uh, maybe I'll send that out with this presentation. Uh, okay, sure. I mean, let me clean it up a little bit then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll make a note of doing that. Okay. Um, does the but I'll also bring it up in part two. You know, Dave, that's something I want to add in part two. This was going over that and then, you know, pimping it, but I can do it now. So we let's try to, we've probably. got like six open questions. Let's try to rip through. Yeah, them. yeah, we're fine. I got nothing uh, to I think people them, have so. been so generous. I, uh, I can't believe everybody's hanging in this long, but it's a good yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this one's easy. Uh, does the amine smell increase as the resin exhausts? <sighs> Thank you. Would it increase it as exhaust? No, I would think it'd be worse at the beginning. Yeah, it should be worse because at the of the hydroxide levels. You know, the higher the pH, which is usually when it's most well regenerated, probably the most more amines will come off, and the more smell could potentially be there. As a resin exhausts, it will have less hydroxide on it and have less less high pH over over in terms of a volume volume of resin. I would think it would smell less. So, yeah, it's probably worse at the beginning. In terms of age, yes, for sure. When it's newer, nothing smells worse on this planet, I have learned, <laughs> than virgin type one plant re resin tech or manufacturer regenerated hydroxide form anion resin. It is the most foulest thing on the planet. Um, so if we ever get into, if you ever get into buying SBG1P or SBG1OH, you know, it's going to smell something fierce, you know, but the chloride forms, the salt forms, the unregenerated forms, they don't smell at all. Not until you regenerate them. You might, you know, if you've ever gotten a box from resin tech, it always smells like fish, but. Um, Cause the paper <laughs> soaks up the smell. Yeah. The paper smokes up the smell. In fact, a good way to mitigate that smell. Any of you listening is get a little bottle of uh, any form of citric cleaner. The citric cleaner takes care of it because it's acidic. It neutralizes the amine. Yep. It goes away immediately. Just like so lemon on your Spray a little in the air. Leave a little mist bottle of a, get some CLR. I'm just kidding, of course. Diluted <laughs> about 20 to one, but spray that in the air. That'll get rid of your amine odor for you. Because once you acidify these amines, they're no longer, they're no longer a gas that you smell. They become an ionized species that stays dissolved in the water or in the, you know, in the case of, from an air perspective, you know, the, the, the water droplet your acid species in will absorb it that way. That's what a scrubber is. You know, a lot of these scrubbers and DI plants, I don't know if anybody you've ever seen one, literally just a little bit of citric acid, you know, going through the, uh, the softballs to try to scrub it out of the air. That's really all it is. You can use any acid really, but citric's pretty benign and safe. Okay. Um are CG8 HBL and SBG2 CL common for both dual and mixed bed systems? Mainly and, dual. I'm sorry, I'll let you finish. I did that. I did, did did that thing again. And are they sent as two different colors, black and amber? Um, so the type two anion, so the black black resin is always obviously always the same. The anion resin, the type two anions are, you know, I guess they're a little more yellow, more translucent yellow, I would say. Than the type ones, the type ones can be a little bit more like a, like a creamy yellow, um, but the type twos, I believe, are more more ambery. I don't know how to describe it. That you know, they look like anion resin, but there are a little bit shades of difference, so they can look a little different. 
terms of uses, uh, in terms of modern day DI, uh, we primarily only see the type two used in dual bed systems. You don't really see it much in mixed beds anymore. It doesn't mean you can't use it. Uh, but one of the things with, with type two that happens is that its degradation mechanism is a little bit different than a type one. When a type one resin degrades, the capacity just stops, it just goes away. It's just no longer there. With a type two, when it degrades, typically it converts over to like a weak base resin, like a weak base function of root, which you might sit there and say, hey, well, that's better than nothing. True. Now you can still remove bulk ions with a type two after it's degrade, but the water quality changes. So in a dual bed system, you know, that's not so bad. If you only need less than 20 microsiemens or 50, and you got a dual bed, you know, that's five years old, that's still hanging in there and the capacity is good, then type two makes a great dual bed resin if, if the customer's water requirements are, you know, you can meet the customer water requirements there. In a mixed bed, it can be a detriment because if you're trying to maintain a high purity water level, you know, such as 10 mega ohms or better in terms of mixed bed quality, well, a type one, even if it's degraded, even if it's lost capacity, can still maintain that water quality over a long period of time. A type two can, can because of the nature of its degradation, may, may or may not be able to make that water quality over a long period of time. You might be on the line. You know, you might find yourself like, ah, oh, this batch just will not rinse up, okay? What do we do? Well, maybe we bleed off some of the anion and, or, and we put in some new stuff. That works too, but that gets expensive. So, um, so I think that dual bed use is situational and or can be used as dual bed in a service environment without much problem. I think mixed beds, again, it can also be used, but I think the way water treatment is going in the high purity water market, uh, our clients are only gonna be demanding higher quality water for longer periods of time that I think that the, the type two uh, is gonna be working against that trend that going to type one um, is gonna be lo longer term, more beneficial to meeting more customers' uh, needs over time. Plus the type one's just cheaper. So that helps too, saves a few bucks. Awesome. Unless, uh, unless, unless, well, I won't say anybody's name. If you know who you are, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead, Caitlin, next question. <laughs> uh, would you use different kinds of mixed bed resin for PD, PEDI versus CDE, bleh, CDI or EDI stuff? Yeah, they use a very specialized, like, so there's, and I'm no expert on CEDI, trust me. Um, I know what it does. I don't know exactly how it does it though. So there are two main types of systems that I'm aware of. There are membrane-based systems where they're literally taking the same cation, like, you know, same CG8 type product, SPG one-ish, wood P type product. Literally they dehydrate it, they dry it out to like less than 5% moisture. And then, and then it gets powdered, uh, like with this, this hammer, I've seen it, this hammer mill, I mean, just smashing resin beads. It's actually really cool. Um, but they powder it up into a real fine powder and then it's somehow mixed with something else and put on a substrate and put in a big roll, right? Looks like a big roll of carpet. Uh, well, a small roll of carpet. And then that's what becomes like a spiral mound membrane. So that's the form that the CEDI type membrane systems use. Some of the earlier, and I think uh, GE, then Suez or whatever, like, you know, I don't know what the name is under these days. They actually use really, 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 really small resin beads. The resins being used are like five times smaller than the stuff that we would use every day in portable exchange, right? Or even just typical DI applications, whether uniform particle size or standard size resin doesn't matter. I mean, so uh, just taking a step back, we talked about typical resin particle size range of 16 to 50 mesh. That's like 1.2 millimeters to 0.3 millimeters. Well, let's talk about it in microns. So Typical resin sizes are 1,200 microns to 300 microns. When we get into this specialized CDI world, you know, those beads are no bigger than 150, 200, 
maybe 300 microns. Again, not an expert in the area, but they are really, 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 really small. So we wouldn't use those resins in our, our typical regen service, even in place world. And they certainly wouldn't use those same resins uh, because of the size. But in terms of the plastic and the, the functional groups, it's all the same stuff. It's just a matter of how, what shape and size it's used in. I think I answered that one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, cool. Um, are you more likely to experience cation or anion breakthrough more rapidly through a mixed bed? Can you say it one more time? Would you be more likely to see anion or cation or anion breaking through? So exhausting more rapidly. Exhausting. Uh, yeah. Usually it's always the anion that's your limiting factor. And it's, you know, multiple reasons. Um, first off, in a typical mixed bed, you know, we're typically doing a 60-40 ratio. If you actually broke down the math and the actual regeneration levels you're getting, you probably need closer to 65 to 70 percent anion to really balance one-to-one -one with the cation capacity. So mixed beds in general are lean to be anion limited, okay? And that's okay. Uh, if you wanna err on one side, it's always better to have excess cation. That keeps the resin cleaner longer and not, doesn't foul it. Uh, so that's a good thing. I, I, I think that is a good way to do things and that's what the industry does. So that makes it easier. Um, the other reason is we talk about what resins remove. You know, yeah, we remove ions, cations, and anions, but there are things in the water that aren't ionized that resins still can remove. And the big ones we talked about today were carbon dioxide and silica, but mainly carbon dioxide, because that's the most appreciable in a lot of cases. Well, not always, but you know, you have these other species that aren't ionized. So the resin still can remove them. On the cation side, there really isn't anything like that. You know, maybe ammonia it could be if there some reason there's ammonia in the water, right? That would be the, probably the most common non-ionized cation I see get removed uh, from, from water. But for your everyday water application, you don't see that. So because there's extra stuff for the anion to remove in addition to the ionic species, mixed beds, DI, dual beds, I don't care what it is, is always, you know, strong base, mind you is going to always be anion limited because of that, unless you do something about it, right? Uh, which is degasifying the water at some point, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, all right. So suppose the resin sits overnight in a, uh, it says dual mixed bed, but I think they mean dual bed. Um, uh -huh. When you first run the water through after it sits overnight, would yep. it, be out of spec for some amount of time or volume and so long, yeah good question yeah did i did uh, no that's it that. okay. that's that's the question sorry Just, mine's mine's firing uh -oh. <laughs> the longer a resin sits the more stuff the more stuff i like to use the word stuff when talking about resin but the more you know leachables can come out of the resin right so these plastic beads aren't perfect you know they're they're made with various chemistries and these chemistries like to come out when they sit, right? So you can regenerate, let's say you had a dual bed, cation anion, and it was sat there for three months, just something nasty. Not gonna shock me one bit if you go to rinse that cation resin and it looks like orange juice. And that's just because some of the polymer, you know, that was, it's been in there. You didn't, nothing's breaking down. It's just been in there, got to sit in water for a very long period of time. And when that happens, all those things kind of come out of the resin. And then when you go to rinse, it just whooshes out. And you can sometimes, especially cation, you can see it because it's that resin-ish color, you know, that orangey, uh, orange juice, as we like to call it. Um, and once you whoosh that out, it doesn't take very long. It usually takes, you know, it might only be a couple of bed volumes of rinse. You know, it could be, you know, five, 10 gallons a cubic foot, and it's out of there, right? Anion does the same thing. You may not be able to visualize it, but... Again, some remnants of leftover from the, the, just the process of making the resin, maybe some of the, the functional groups, you know, just, you know, again, they're in a constant state of degradation, you know, just kind of concentrate up. Again, you've had a set volume of water just sitting in with the resin for a long period of time. They're just going to keep getting more and more concentrated as it just sits there. So if you have those cases, as long as you've kept them sealed and 
There's no other factors like biological growth, which usually doesn't happen with DI resins very often, especially components. Um, or, you know, we didn't let air get in. That's the big one on anion resin. You know, there's plenty of carbon dioxide in the air uh, that can really, you know, the resin will remove it just like if it was in water, it just absorbs it. So as long as we keep it underwater and sealed, you're not really gonna get much air intrusion or CO2 intrusion in the case of anion. Cation resin doesn't really have that problem. There's really nothing in the air, uh, unless we're in some ammonia factory, right? Back to the ammonia, the what if, but uh, they'll stay pretty well preserved underwater and sealed, but they will have that phenomenon of just liquid, ju the juice, the juices as we call them, uh, kind of concentrating up. It's always best to rinse them prior to use and you're always best served rinsing them individually. So just rinse the cation first, rinse it to drain. I would just visually, you can just look at that one. If it doesn't look yellow or orange, you're good. And then put it to the anion resin and just rinse it until it meets a, a minimum water quality spec, right? And the longer thing, so when you think about it in the field scenario, you know, you got these hooked up and the customer might be turning their systems on and off. Um, well, the longer it sits, the longer it might take to return to quality. But if they're using these, DI systems on a regular basis, on a daily basis, you know, usually the recovery is more, it, it, pretty quick. Um, it's the ones that use the DI water system once every two weeks that might take a little longer to rinse up every time. So to me, it's always a function of sit. How long did it sit? How much time did it sit? The longer it sits, the better chance you'll have to rinse it a little bit longer. So. All right. Covered that one. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. Um, if you brine the resin, should you double regenerate it? Um, for a typical field regenerator, you don't. Because um, you don't really, when you're brining, so we need to define brining, right? Here we go again, right? Your, your typical brine kill in the field, you're, you're, you're not completely converting the resin. You're really just kind of targeting getting those remnants of regeneration, or at least most of them off. So when we've done analysis, and I've only done a few of them over my career, but when you actually look at what's on these resins after a brine kill, it's not pure sodium chloride, right? You still have plenty of hardness. You still have plenty of alkalinity and other things on the resin. So to double, have to double regenerate every time, the answer is no, if you're just doing a simple brine kill. Now, if you slammed it with, you know, 50 pounds per cubic foot of salt, where it's guaranteed to be 100% in the sodium and the chloride form, then I'd say, yeah, you're probably in your best interest to double regenerate them. Um, but for your average day-to-day -day brine kill separation, you don't really need to do that. Um, conversely, uh, you know, when we talk about in-place for general generation levels versus service exchange DI generation levels. If anybody's on here and you've had me walk into your plant and give you my two cents, I'm always thinking, you, you know, I'm always telling you eight to 10 pounds per cubic foot of regen. And this is a good number. This kind of takes that into account. You know, if you really wanted to break down the, to the minutia, like to the minor, minor, just what's the minimum, bare minimum chemical that you need? Well, you know, if you're not using brine, and we get good separations, you might only need like six or seven pounds of acid. You might only need six or seven pounds of caustic, but using that eight to 10 pound range kind of covers your, your brine kill side of things. And in the end, I'm all about, at least when I'm, when I'm involved with the DIP you know, folks out there, and I just have to say you're all, you poor bastards. Um, you know, I'm thinking about consistency and process. So, I want to see you backwash. I want to see you get consistent backwash every time. I want to see you get consistent regeneration levels every time. I want to see you have ease of mix and transfer and startup every time. You want to produce the same thing over and over again. So that way you can predict it, you can sell it, and you can service it with confidence. It makes your business run so much smoother versus trying to be adapting all the time. You know, one thing might work on this resin today, but it may not work on the next batch tomorrow. So um, to circle back, uh, no, you don't because you're not really killing it with enough salt to really require it. 
unless you happen to do an extra kick or an extra dose for some other reason. Um, I don't think you need to add it as a standard practice. I think you can just maintain your standard levels of regen and be more than fine. Awesome. I'm losing it. Um, okay. That's two. <laughs> No, no, uh, I can keep going, but I'm just going to get kookier, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're almost, we're almost done. We oh, no, it's more. fine. I, hey, and this is what I'm here for, you know? Um, does, does cavitation enhance rinsing? Cavitation. I understand what they're getting. Vibrating, right? Yeah. Making the resin move. Um, from a re conversion perspective, like getting more levels of regeneration no i don't see why that's a chemistry that's chemistry driven not physically driven what cavitation or the vibration if i understand the question correctly it can actually help clean the resin quite quite good if you happen to have a a, a resin that's getting dirty just from the influent water you know some sometimes these suspended matter just likes to stick you know resin's a great charge neutralizer we didn't really talk about this um when we talk about what a cation resin bead, it is just a big ball of anion. This is a big anion ball of plastic. And a cation resin, or an, excuse me, an anion resin is just a big cationic ball of plastic. And most suspended solids or pieces of dirt, you know, they're going to have some charge to them just because if they're metal, metal bearing, like, you know, you know, silica, dirt, you know, iron, whatever, those have some nature of charge to them. So they'll like to stick to beads. Um, and simple backwashing doesn't always take care of it. You know, a lot of times, especially in the DI world, we're, we're hitting it with pretty, pretty strong chemistry chemicals that, you know, for the most part, we're washing those things off. And again, DI is usually used on very clean waters, not on dirty waters. But if you happen to have a, a dirty situation, a good old vibration cavitation will help break some of those fine particles off the bead. It certainly wouldn't hurt it. Um, you know, we kind of, you know, field stuff that we would recommend, and I've done it a few times, um, you know, just air lancing, you know, that's always, that's always a trip, you know, it's basically a pipe of, a pipe stick it in a resin tank and turn the air on, just watch it rumble and go all over the place. Um, but that's basically the same principle. Let's get the resin moving. Let's get the resin banging. Let's help break up some of that particulate so that when we go to backwash, we can get it out. And, uh, that would really be the only case I would think you'd want to cavitate. But I did see something cool. This was 20 years ago that, you know, if you guys ever loaded a DI tank, you know, you're scooping it in maybe by vacuum or if you're doing, you know, the liquid transfers into tanks, you know, you got to sometimes shake the tank, maybe hit it with the rubber mallet to kind of loosen it up and get it to settle down so you get more resin in there. I saw this company, I won't name the name, but they devised this really cool, like, I don't know what to call it, like a cage and they could put two 1447s on it. And it was just like vibrating, just shaking it, you know, like, like, you know, just doing one of these. Right. And that was, instead of having to hold the tank and hit it with a rubber mallet, this thing would just shake it back and forth and just settle it down. It was just, it was the neatest thing I'd ever seen. Um, it was custom made. They kind of made it for themselves, but it worked, you know, it uh, helped settle that resin down for sure. Okay, I answer that one. All right. Um, okay, uh, this is the last one in the thing for right now. It says, um, "Can you regenerate slash clean hardness fouled resin?" Sure. So, typically, where we see the hardness fouling, you know, uh, there's some context to this. So let's we got to break it up into two. Okay. So let's talk about anion resin first. So when anion resins get hardness fouled, it's due to hardness exposure to a hydroxide form anion resin. In that case, you're dealing with a calcium carbonate precipitant. And calcium carbonate precipitants are readily dissolved by acid. So if you do have a hardness fouled anion resin that started in the hydroxide form and got exposed to hardness, your sequence of cleaning will be this. First, you got to kill it. You got to make sure all the hydroxide is off the resin. So that would start with a simple brine rinse or soaking in brine, some form of brine. Get it in the chloride form. Let's get all the hydroxide in and off. So you, after you do that, you want to rinse it out. Make sure your pH is near neutral. Okay, now we have a resin. The best acid to use to clean 
uh, is, is hydrochloric acid. And you don't need like, you know, 10%, doesn't hurt, that's for sure. But, you know, a couple percent solution is more than adequate. And then you introduce it to the resin itself. Um, and then basically that acid dissolves that calcium carbonate into solution and rinses it off the resin. So that's would be how you recover it. Be mindful though, when you're doing that, you're basically doing an acid-based neutralization. You can create heat, you can create an exotherm and you will create carbon dioxide gas. So it's very important when you are doing a anion cleaning like this, that A, you're in a well-ventilated area, you're not under pressure in stagnated water, making sure, meaning it's open atmosphere, there's some release of pr for pressure or the water is moving. Um, so that way you don't cause the, the tank to pop um, from too much pressure. Uh, so that would be the anion approach, that's the most common. Um, cation hardness fouling is a little tricky. So when we have a hardness of cation resins, it's usually due to calcium sulfate precipitation. And calcium sulfate is not like calcium carbonate. It is near impossible to get cleaned off of a resin. So if th this happens to be a situation for a dual bed system in place in the field where the client was using sulfuric acid for regen um, and they ex ex exposed the resin to too high of a concentration too soon and they form calcium sulfate, I don't know what to tell you. It's usually a lot of physical cleaning. A lot of times it's best to remove the resin from the vessel and try to clean it externally. There is no easy way to dissolve it. You can try chucking in high concentrations of hydrochloric to get some of it to redissolve, but most of the time it's not gonna be worth your effort. You're better off just sucking it out pitching it and putting new stuff in. And that's the truth. Um, you know, in my whole conversation today, I didn't talk about sulfuric acid once because in a portable exchange DI context, it's not something you want to use because of this calcium sulfate precipitation potential. And any little hair off during regen, you can, you can, you can cause some serious calcium fouling of your resin. So uh, in the SDI world, we tend to stick to hydrochloric for this reason. Uh, even though it's a little bit more expensive, it just works. You don't have to worry about these things. Again, it goes back to consistent process. It doesn't mean you can't use sulfuric acid, but we're going to take a lot of steps to ensure that you, you preserve the resin quality when you use it. So back to the original question, anion of cal hardness fouled anion, typically a hydroxide environment, pretty straightforward to clean and recoverable. If you did somehow hardness file cation, most likely it has to do with this calcium sulfate issue. You're better off just pitching it and starting over again. Luckily, cation is not that expensive, obviously relative to anion, but uh, uh, it's just not worth the trouble. And we have a lot of it, right, Bill? Yes, plenty of cation. <laughs> Cation's easy. Yeah, well, maybe call us in a month. Call me in a month. Don't ask me for cation today. All right. Um, Bill, thank you so much. Great presentation. Is that everybody, do we get every question? I don't want to leave me. We, we got everybody's question. Okay. Um, and I want to thank our, our attendees for hanging in there as long as they did. This was uh, really, really informative. And if you liked this month's presentation, stick around for next month's on June 23rd. It's right there on your screen. If you have your cell phone handy, please pull it out, scan that QR code, give us some feedback on, on this uh this webinar, we're always trying to do better for you folks. So, uh, you know, please take a moment and scan that and give us your thoughts. I want to thank my friend Sid Singh in Australia who hung hung in there, stayed up all night long. He's caffeinated. He's going to be a little bit off tomorrow, I'm sure, locally. But Sid, thanks for hanging in. And we will catch everybody on Wednesday, June 23rd at 11 a.m. I'm going to send out the the recording. I'm going to send out the presentation. I'm going to send out uh um bill's uh calculator as well as soon as he provides yeah, i'll clean it. that up i'll send it over to you today dave all right or, you know i'm gonna go eat though because i'm hungry appreciate it okay everybody thank you so much we'll see you next month have a good day right, thanks everybody